we are very privileged today to have um, the ambassador of the Islamic Republic of, uh, of Afghanistan to India to come and talk to us about revisiting South Asia, some practical steps towards fostering a shared regional consciousness. This is, as you know, a part of our distinguished lecture series in which we have had some very distinguished scholars who have come to speak to us, like Professor Paula Richman, Professor Jeffrey, then we have had the um, Mr. Karma, who is the CEO of the Sark Development Fund, the High Commissioner of Pakistan, uh, High Commissioner Basit, and now we have today with us the um, Ambassador Abdali. <clears throat> now I know he doesn't need an introduction, and uh, but still I have a small little introduction. I won't take up too much of your time. So uh, this is what I have, and if there is something that is left behind, then I'd be happy to add to it. His uh, Excellency Shahida Muhammad Abdali is the Ambassador of the Islamic Rep Republic of Afghanistan to the Republic of India. He is also the non-resident ambassador of Afghanistan to Nepal, Bhutan, and the Maldives, which really means that he's accredited to all these three countries. I don't know why this strange terminology has been used here. He formerly served as the deputy national security advisor and special assistant to the former president of Afghanistan, His Excellency Hamid Karzai. Ambassador Abdali provided the President with policy and oversight advice on national security issues. <coughs> he administered the National Security Council meetings and chaired the dep Deputy Committee meetings of the National Security Council, which facilitated strategic coordination and communication among Afghan and international stakeholders to help address Afghanistan's security and development needs. Moreover, uh, Ambassador Abdali served as one of the key negotiators of the enduring strategic partnership agreement between Afghanistan and the United States. Are you actually doing a PhD from GNU? Yes? Yes. Yes? OK. <laughs> so he has uh, I wish I could do it here, but <laughs> I didn't have the time. <clears throat> he has BA degrees in political science and natural sciences and an MA in strategic security studies from the National Defense University of the United States. There are lots of other awards that I could read out to you, but what intrigued me was that he's actually pursuing a PhD from the Jawaharlal Nehru University. So with these few words, I pass it on to Ambassador Abdali. You go there? Wherever you like. If you want to stand there, fine. If you want to sit here, fine. Whatever. Can I stand there? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. A very good afternoon, Honorable Ambassador Felita Sharma, distinguished faculty, and more importantly, students, including my Afghan fellows, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you and I to cut my long waiting and desiring to come and speak in this very distinguished university. And I was just further telling the honorable that I would have just bumped in if I had not received oh, these days. But I'm grateful that I'm finally here and have the honor 
to interact with you. The format is that I will speak for a few minutes on the very timely topic of original consciousness. It's a very interesting topic. And then move on to jointly discuss and explore opportunities together for fostering really what we are looking at. Now I'll begin by focusing on what the problem is now that we don't have what we are desiring. And why we otherwise the resourceful region that we are yet remains insecure, disintegrated and underdeveloped. which causes the lack of regional consciousness. If you look at the history of our relations in South Asia, which remain opaquely radical, in other words, zero-sum mindset has dominated our foreign policies in the region. <coughs> and that domination has Im impacted the making of policies which will lead us towards a change and toward making and implementing what we all desire. Pursuing such a posture has increasingly become very counterproductive, both for security and development reasons. And I wouldn't talk about countries in South Asia, but I will talk about my own country and give you a case study of my own country as to how Afghanistan stands out in the realm of this current situation and the impact of my country or over the rest of the region. As we all know, for a long time, it was thought that the problem of terrorism and extremism would somehow be limited to Afghanistan. That was how countries in South Asia always thought that what is happening in Afghanistan has nothing to do with the rest of the region. Everyone tried to protect itself individually, did not bother so much what was happening elsewhere particularly in the neighborhood. And this went on almost for three decades. That Afghanistan has been suffering mainly for an external imposed conflict. And frankly speaking, this mindset served constantly countries who thought this was in the interest of them. And a country, as I said earlier, Afghanistan, that can and must do so much for this region in terms of connecting, in terms of the transit trade that it can serve, and serve not on its own interests, but the interests of the entire region. But gradually it became apparent that the destabilization effort of Afghanistan has a lot of spillover effects. 
which has already undermined the stability of not only Afghanistan and the countries immediately neighboring Afghanistan, but the region as a whole. And there are many examples of how these spillover effects have occurred and what and how much it has inflicted on other countries in the region. And I wouldn't go far. I'll give you an example of a country that we have so much in common, yet not so much in reality. And we have always talked about us being together. By all means, if you, if you take it as values, history, future, and of course the past. And terrorism has not been limited to Afghanistan. It has gone beyond the indifference to Afghanistan's current, Afghanistan's internal situation has backfired against those indifferent state announced actors in almost every country in South Asia. And I would give example of a country that suffers equally, like Afghanistan. And a few months ago you heard the very tragic incident of 140 innocent school children killed in Pakistan, in a school. A horrible incident. incident. An incident that no one can justify against the innocent children who has nothing to do with politics that we are in fact referring to it so much. And I'm not going to give other examples because this is fair enough to give as a prime example of what, what produces and an indifference to a situation coming in your neighborhood. And of course we have suffered throughout almost three decades in that manner. School children, teachers, common people dying almost every day. not because of Afghanistan's domestic reasons. And I told you earlier, it is, and it has been all along, an imposed conflict on Afghanistan. And that has not been limited to Afghanistan. It has gone beyond our borders. Therefore, our conscientiousness should tell us nothing but to say that it is high time to change the course. It's high time to change the status quo and move from zero sum to win-win and to a win-win mindset. And these tensions among us has cost us greatly, not only financially but in any other aspect of life and we paid greatly. And I don't want to give many examples because there are so many. And I would be more interested, of course, to get to our later, later session of an interaction with one another as to how together we can foster the great idea of realizing regional consciousness. So as, as of now, as we all know, that we are paced paid a great price for the status quo of the kind of foreign policies, as I said earlier, have been dominated in our countries. And we must start rethinking our zero-sum approaches to one another. And learn from the rest of the world how the world has developed. And it has not been developed individually. <coughs> We always give example of an analogy of 
a joint effort of men and women. You can't develop without shaking hand with your neighbor. To go the journey the way the, you, the way you desire, and also desire equally the same for a neighbor that will go along with you. And I said, as I said earlier, our region has everything. We are sh short of nothing that any region in the world has. In fact, we have more than what the rest of the world has to build on and develop and become jointly prosperous. We have human resources, as you all know, abundance of natural resources, untapped. We are the luckiest regions that we have almost all of our natural resources are still untapped. Whereas every other region in the world has already used, utilized, and they're looking for, looking outside markets and natural resources to bring it to their markets. But we have our own untapped still. Therefore, we have a great chance, a golden opportunity to move fast, past, in a pace that the rest of the world is running and achieving the goals that they have set for themselves. If we make, make peace as the core objectives of our nations, of course, without no doubt, we will have our region secure on a sustainable basis and develop on a sustainable basis as well. But of course, the precondition is security. That should be our prime goal to ensure so that we build on and move ahead. Of course, anything can be achieved. But peace, as we know, a country that got hurt so much from this aspect should be used by others as a country and of course for them as well as an objective that unless we ensure peace, we can't move. Therefore, a peace in Afghanistan is a peace and a platform for all of us together to move on and change and break down the wall that we have currently and go towards constructive partnerships. And there are so many examples of how we can build on to become, to move towards a collective prosperity. And of course we can take baby steps. We can't change the course overnight. We have to do the doables. And of course there are a number of economic projects that we've been always talking. Once we realize, I'm sure it will impact on the mindset of policymakers, because that will create integration, that will create interest of one another into one another markets. Again, I'll give a couple of examples of projects that can move us and make the move that we are seeking. The project of energy, for example and that every country in this region has a stake. A project called TAPI, as you all know, it has been talked about for almost more than 20 years now. If this project is realized, it will not only bring energy to our countries, but it will also bring connection between our peoples. It will also create a common cause. It will also create dependence on one another. And it, it will also tear down, tear down the indifference, the wall of the indifference that we've had all along, that what it means to one to have peace and stability in his neighborhood.
Therefore, peace and stability in Afghanistan is key for peace and stability in the entire region. But I must tell you that Afghanistan has gone a long way to make the journey together with you and to become a source of prosperity to everyone. In the last 14 years, Afghanistan has achieved a lot. There's one thing that I keep mentioning that the narrative about Afghanistan should change based on the ground realities. We're not saying that we have to make glory of a situation that doesn't reflect the reality. What is the ground realities of, in Afghanistan should be reflected and must lead towards a narrative that will help us to join hands and have a fresh start. Afghanistan is now no more Afghanistan of, of Afghanistan in the 1990s. Afghanistan in the last 14 years has developed a lot. And I wouldn't talk about many other things, but something that is relevant in our today's gathering, which is education. And you have a great example of a number of Afghan students sitting here, and of course elsewhere, elsewhere in India, who are studying and of course will be going back to complete what is left for them in terms of rebuilding their own homeland. <laughs> Afghanistan has universities. Afghanistan has schools, children going to school, millions of them. Afghanistan has students all over the world today. All in India, we have more than 10,000. The figures vary because students come on their own. They don't need to inform the government. They don't need to inform the embassy. It's good for them to come freely and educate. If they have the resources, the means to educate without asking the government for help. Some figures even tell me that there are around 16,000 students in India. This is one of the achievements of the last 14 years. Of course, economic development, businesses, income per capita from 200 to almost 1,000 today. Improvements in telecommunication, IT is a great example of, of, of of our current generation to avail of so much. And Afghanistan is doing remarkably good in achieving the development in the IT sector. You, f you will hardly find an Afghan without using mobile phone today. And I must tell you my personal story. Being in Kabul late in 2001, right after the fall of the Taliban, I happened to be working with the former president in my earlier capacities. We came to Kabul right after the fall of the Taliban. I give example because I mentioned IT sector. And there were no mobile phone at all in Afghanistan. No single mobile phone. Landlines only in few government buildings. We had no country code of our own. Our telephones call would be dialed through our neighboring country. We had no of our own country code. <coughs> and I had the pleasure of having the first mobile phone in my hand as a gift to our president. I remember in 2002, Kufi Annan visited Afghanistan and he brought a mobile phone and gifted it to our president as a gift. 
And I remembered the joy, the pleasure that I had. How come I have a mobile phone? And I was the only government official to have the mobile phone. I remember people coming, running up to me, please give me a phone, I just want to make a call to so and so. Today, out of a population of almost 30 million population, we have 22 million people using mobile phones. This is one of the success stories of Afghanistan's journey in the last 14 years. And there are so many other good examples. We had only six universities in Afghanistan. Today we have more than 100 universities, more private, I must say that, which is good sign for Afghanistan. They don't depend on the government institutions that they should always give education the private sector, they do it on their own, and they have universities all across Afghanistan. And I have to inform you that, that my mission here is not only just to talk politics, but much more to discuss how we can do better in education, how we can do better in economic development, how we can do better in so many other areas in culture. But education has always been on the top of my agenda. And wherever I go, I make sure that one of Afghanistan's universities has a tie with another university in India. Of course, we have a number of university types in India, in Delhi, and I'm very pleased that we are working on South Asian University with Kabul University, and I hope very soon this agreement and MOU will be realized to move on educational collaboration between our universities and I'm, I'm doing it all over India. Whichever state I go, I make sure I go to university, talk to them about education collaboration and arrange an agreement between one of Afghanistan's universities in Afghanistan. For example, I give example of my just last visit that I had to the state of Madhya Pradesh to the city of Bhopal, the capital, which Afghanistan has a very old relationship with. A relationship dates back to almost 300 years. Thousands of Afghans still live in Bhopal from the old times. A university called Barakatullah, you must know about the name. Barakatullah, a name who is so known to Afghans as well, was one of the six or seven freedom fighters Championing from the for the freedom of India from the foreign colonial power, visiting Afghanistan in the form of the first government in exile given by Afghans to free India from foreign colonial power. So we know and and knew so much the name Barakatullah and the, the the honor to have that university to tie up with one of Afghanistan's university. You know, Sheikh Zaid University of of host. This is just one example and I did it all over. I, do, I, I, I was all, uh, earlier in uh, Assam, did the same JNU University all the time with Kabul University, with Kandahar University. JNU is also going to be tied up with or Baghlan University. And this will go on so that we expand and have more education collaborations because this is very important that we expand our relationships in every sector, in every sector. So coming back to Afghanistan's strategic role in the region, to the main topic. As you all know, Afghanistan is located very strategic in this region. It does not bring only prosperity to its people, it brings prosperity to a wider region, both politically, economically, and otherwise, and of course culturally, Afghanistan has traditionally been a place, a center of contact of the entire region. And of course countries around Afghanistan has a great interest to make sure Afghanistan stabilizes, particularly countries like India, countries in South Asia, the Central Asians, because the countries that surround us based on what I discussed earlier, would benefit greatly from Afghanistan's peace and stability. And there is no doubt of the realization at this point 
that they know that that their stability, their prosperity also depend at the same time on Afghanistan's peace and stability. That is at least a good start to have the realization that Afghanistan is crucial in what we desire always as a region, integrated, united, and be prosperous as a region. And Afghanistan, of course, it has a critical role to play in this regard. And Afghanistan's role, particularly in the SARC mechanism, there's one thing which I don't hear much of when it comes to Afghanistan's membership in the SARC region. You all know Afghanistan is not entirely a South Asian nation. It's also a Central Asian nation. We have our two feet, one in Central Asia, the other one in South Asia. That is the importance and the significance of fabrication. And the very concept as to why Afghanistan should become member of SARC. The very concept which came up was how to benefit from Afghanistan's location in the SARC region. That is the very reason why Afghanistan became the member. And unfortunately, as we have failed in realizing many other core objectives of SARC, we have failed to make use of Afghanistan's membership in the SARC region. The reason of Afghanistan to become a member of the SARC was to ensure that Afghanistan plays a role of land bridge between South Asia and Central Asia. Out of all other objectives, whatever we have failed, this is, going, this is one of the crucial objectives of the SARC region. Because there, there are so many difficulties we have in our, in our, in our relationships. And I said earlier, there, there are things that are doable. We can't change things overnight, but we have to start from somewhere. Economic integration, connectivity is something that no country has a problem on or a problem with. Every country in the region needs to be integrated. And you all witness the economic recession that is, that is affecting our countries. And there is no other way other than integrating our economies. And there comes Afghanistan. If South Asia and Central Asia to be connected, there is no point of this connectivity without Afghanistan. Afghanistan is the only country that can ensure this vision that must be a joint vision and a shared vision of every country in South Asia. And unfortunately, this core objective of SARC vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan has been not talked so much about as to why Afghanistan is there. But this has a crucial role, a crucial purpose to have Afghanistan a member of, of SARC. And of course, I keep visiting Kathmandu because I know there's the headquarters of, 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 of uh, the SARC organization and I keep telling that, that we must work on issues that can take everyone along. And I don't think any country would have a problem with regard to talking of how we connect our economies. And that is the doable that we should start. And comes back to the very question of how we rea realize the regional con consciousness. A nation is built on a common cause. Region is built on a common cause that can be built on a common cause. And I don't see any problem with regard to this cause when it comes to countries and the goals the countries have with regard to their own prosperities. Our national unity government, as you all know, has just started its work and of course has reached out to every, uh, every neighbor of ours, including Pakistan, to put an end to the war and conflict in Afghanistan. Because I hope by now there is no any dispute over analyzing and examining what's going on in Afghanistan. And I don't think anyone can argue about Afghanistan's problems derived from external roots. That's the reality. And the war to be ended 
can only be ensured if there is a cooperation from our neighbors. And if, in that light, we have reached out to every neighbor of ours, and we're hoping that our neighbors will join hand with Afghanistan towards a shared peace, prosperity, and development. And we hope that the signature projects such as the TAPI, CASA 1000 energy project, which brings energy from Central Asia to South Asia, will be realized after the consensus or the agreement that we have among us after waiting for so long. Coming to Afghanistan in their relationship, because this is what very important to Afghanistan when it comes to our relationship in the region, the country that we value so much. And India is exactly what, doing what, exactly what I just said in terms of a shared goal to pursue in Afghanistan. India has become, has been very constructive player of the shared goals the way I just described which is, for India, a peaceful, stable, and developed Afghanistan is in the interest of India. And that's exactly what India has been doing. And therefore, we highly appreciate the contribution, the assistance that India has extended to Afghanistan over the last many years, particularly in the last 13 years. You all know India is not a donor. It doesn't donate countries so much because it has its own so many challenges. Yet India has gone out of its way to help Afghanistan with over two billion US dollars. It's a lot of money. It's the largest contribution that we have given to any country in the world. So we greatly value this cooperation and hope that this will continue so that we have the shared interest in the pursuit of what we have been doing through this, through the assistance that you have given, that India has given. As I said earlier, India has a strategic significance to Afghanistan and it's worth mentioning that Afghanistan has a lot of relationships, strategic relationships all over the world. But Afghanistan started its strategic relationship with India. This is a very important point to examine the importance and the closeness of the two countries. How much they are close, how much they trust one another, how much they are sharing with one another. In 2011, Afghanistan signed its first strategic partnership with India. It's a, it's a very elaborative one. It's a very ex, you know, expensive, uh, a comprehensive one. It includes cooperation in all respects, including economic, political, security, cultural, and all that. And we have made great progress towards realizing the provisions of the strategic partnership agreement. Internally, I have focused, as I said earlier, economic development is a key factor. And I have been pursuing a very strong economic diplomacy in India. And I'm very happy to see Prime Minister Modi taking the lead not only for India to get it connected with other countries, but also help other countries change the course in terms of their priorities. India's leading role to connect the region, India's leading role to revitalize SARC are very appreciative. Prime Minister Modi 
invitation to the SAC leaders was a great start. Because he always insists that India cannot develop without being joined with the rest of the region. And we are strongly supporting the idea of integration. Economic integration, political integration, cultural uh, integration, and he is doing very well in that respect. I hope as Afghanistan reciprocates, everyone else in this region will also reciprocate, especially the South Asians, to join hand with Prime Minister Modi and make SARC a region, a mechanism that ensures the realization of the core objectives of SARC. Because the SARC region, the SARC mechanism was, is aimed at benefiting from this me, uh, me, uh, mechanism in terms of unity, in terms of prosperity. And the last heads of, uh, state, uh, heads of uh, uh, state visit to Kathmandu was a great success in terms of the declaration which was given. And we hope that we will implement as has been declared in Kathmandu. In view of India's in economic integration plans and programs, Afghanistan, again, as has a role to play for the rest of the region, has a very strong role to play for India's a number of economic related plans. For example, India has a plan of Connect Central Asia, as is the East Look that you have. And Afghanistan has a critical role to play how India can be connected with Central Asia. And we have a number of good um, projects that we're working with India to connect Afghanistan with Indian markets and of course extending it, extended it to the rest of the region, particularly to Central Asia. As you all know, Afghanistan is working on the constant connectivity between India and Afghanistan through Chabahar which is in view of India's and Afghanistan's shared goal to connect its markets with one another, hopefully we'll able to realize the shared interests, which will by extension help everyone else in the region. So it's a win-win again, that the status quo must change to win-win. And of course, in parties, you can't do and you can't have everything without thinking of the interest of another. For example, Afghanistan needs to be connected with, with South Asia. South Asia needs to be connected with Central Asia. So this is a win-win, give and take. That's how relationships are based on. We hope that we all help one another to arise the shared goals, which is in the context of win-win mindset. So I'll sum up by saying that we are no longer isolated from one another, based on what I just described. And we cannot afford to have and we cannot afford not to have the regional consciousness anymore. We have already paid enough price for the short-minded policies that we've had vis-a-vis -vis one another in the last three decades. And I don't think we can afford anymore. It is late, but it's still not too late. And we must grab the opportunity of what is possible today to make sure that we ensure regional consciousness by all the fallouts that we have suffered because of the short-minded and the failed foreign policies that we've had based on zero-sum. And needless to say that institutions of learning has a great role to play to make the governments make that move. It's not about only the businesses to talk about to push governments. It's about the mindset 
it's about the knowledge, it's about the very need, needful research that can be only conducted in places of learning like South Asia University. And I was very happy to know earlier of the plan to have a think tank under the umbrella of South Asia University. Because you can't discuss everything at, at the track one level. Track two can help and complement track one, which is the government. And I was very pleased to know that this is very symbolic piece when you talk about SARC, SARC revitalization. And it can be very strongly supported if there is a place where research is conducted, where debate is conducted as to what is wrong with, 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 this, with what we are as, as, a, as countries not moving beyond the status quo. And you, scholars, researchers, can help greatly vis-a-vis -vis the governments in South Asia to make that step, to move beyond where we are. And of course, this is the place where we're going to have the future leaders of our countries. And I hope that South Asia University will become a home for all South Asians for learning. And I know the chemistry which is created when you have classmates in classrooms, in hostels. You never forget your classmate. I know of the stories when people exchange. The most pleasant stories of the time when you are a student. When you, have, when you talk about uh, your classmate. So places like this are going to produce leaders for our countries tomorrow. And I hope that all South Asia South Asian countries will send their students as designed to this university where they learn together, where they know each other together, where they talk of the shared goals, the values that they have with one another, and they become the leaders of tomorrow. Without any doubt, they will bring the countries together. So thank you very much for inviting me to this very important introduction. <laughs>